There we go. All right, now, do, 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 do. there we go. Okay, that's better. <laughs> that is so funny. I had uh, my, so I have an audio device, a Claret, a Focusrite Claret, and uh, just for some reason decided it didn't want to be uh, on anymore. And I looked I, like it's the lights are on. Everything looked like it was working, but it's, it wasn't actually uh, doing anything. So then went into my control panel and it doesn't even show anything going on inside there. I'm like, oh, well, there we go. So good morning, folks. How's it going? It's a beautiful 422 in the morning here in uh, San Diego. Have quite some time before the coffee shops open. So, mm. Yeah, folks, all over from uh, Europe this morning, of course, because it's normal over on your side of the pond for you to be uh, up. Now, submit from Amsterdam. So uh, what I'm going to do this morning, so I need to update my DBA training classes. So now I've got, I, basically you think of it, the database administration job description is really kind of broken into two things. Everybody thinks that DBAs are just one big lump of people. There's just the DBAs and we're all in one big uh, group together. But it's a little different than that. So I wrote this blog post quite a while back, job duties for database developers, development DBAs, and production DBAs, kind of breaking out the different groups of us and what we do. And I'm going to click on the image in it, uh, in it just because it really helps to lay out the differences between the different job roles. You can see things look a little different this morning because I'm actually sharing the entire desktop on my Mac. I have my Mac scaled down to like 1080p just to make it easier for y'all. But today I'm going to be showing you the native tools that I use on a Mac when I'm doing some of my day-to-day -day work. So in here we have these three columns. We have uh, database developer, development DBA, and production DBA. The, the, all of the work involved with building and hosting a database application is over on the far left. So you think of it as designing tables, writing queries, and deploying changes. Developers usually come from the top down, and then systems administrators like Windows admins, network admins, etc., come from the bottom up. <coughs> and they just start with these dramatically different skills. Well, over, over on the far left and on this mid, mid column, I got lots of courses that cover these. I've got my fundamentals of uh, index tuning, fundamentals of query tuning, fundamentals of parameter sniffing, going all the way up to mastering uh, uh, things. Um, oh, good, nice. Uh, uh, SQL Dev DBA talking about, uh, uh, yeah, that guide. Perfect. That's very good to hear. And I try to make stuff that's reusable for people, so especially that if I can communicate it in a way that's easier for managers to understand. Then we have production DBAs over here. So they focus on troubleshooting outages, installing and configuring SQL Server, and then to some extent, they do some performance monitoring, but they're not really as good at it as the people in the middle column. Well, I got performance nailed down. I got courses all over performance going every which way but sideways. But you know what I don't have a whole lot of anymore is this, over in this column, Production Database Administration. There was a while there where Microsoft was like, the cloud, we're all in. And it, it didn't really matter what, exactly, price-wise, you're exactly right. So I have a couple of classes. I'm going to go pop over and show you over on my training page. So I got a couple of classes here. I got a lot of stuff around performance tuning. If you go down further, there's the mastering performance tuning. Then you get into this. You get into the database administration. And you notice that the class names aren't exactly the same. So you got fundamentals of database administration, which is a roughly one day's worth of stuff that we put together back when Eric Darling worked for the company eh, a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, I guess coming up on, yeah, like a year and a half, two years ago. And uh, then we have the senior DBA class, which I love the name of. I don't think that that, I think I'm going to just blow away both of those, though. I'm going to restart from scratch and just redo everything from the ground up. And the reason why I'm doing that is I'm like, I, when I first stopped, I, actually, let me t zoom way back and tell you, like, from a personal perspective. <laughs> I stopped doing production database administration. I don't do it anymore. I don't focus on backups, configuration, troubleshooting when the cluster goes down. I just don't do that stuff anymore. I found it very uninteresting because I'd been doing it for so long. I don't know if it's, I have a personality type where I don't want to do the same thing for like 10 years straight. I want to mix things up all the time and move on to the next thing. I was so burned out 
on the material in the senior DBA class. I was so burned out on the materials of fundamentals of database administration. So those courses, I haven't touched them really in like three, four, five years. Um, and I, I don't really intend to start doing database administration again. I don't intend to start focusing on backups, fixing the SQL server when it's broken. Because really, those are 24-7 production type jobs. I'm a consultant. I like to get drunk. I like to go on vacation. I don't want to be on call. My idea of a bad time is being on call. I was so happy when I started doing the consulting thing and I wasn't on call anymore. I just never want to do that again. However, I keep looking at the market and there isn't a lot of good training. There isn't a lot of training material, period. I don't mean to slam anybody's material. There just isn't a lot of training material out there on the basics of database administration and senior database administration. And she says, what are some topics from your side impact on the DBA's role, blah, 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 blah. That's what we're talking about inside here. I'm going to talk about the things that I think, and I'm going to write down, and we're going to build a course around the things that I think are fundamentals of database administration, things that I think everyone should know when they're handed a SQL server. And then we're also going to talk through what I think mastering uh, database administration looks like. And I also want to build a course that has hands-on labs. So you've, a lot of y'all have been through my fundamentals classes, or some of you have been through my mastering classes where I do hands-on labs. I want that same thing in both fundamentals and for on the mastering side. Now, when we get to the mastering side, I'll talk about some of the complexities of building labs with that, because really for mastering, I'm going to want two instances of SQL Server. We're going to want to do failovers back and forth, for example. That's going to be some, that's going to make things a little tricky because there are a lot of different technologies around database mirroring, log shipping, failover clustering, always on availability groups, all uh, kinds of that. Wow, Jim, holy smokes. Um, I, a friend of mine, so I have so many interesting pilot tie-ins there. So my wife used to work for the airlines and then was a flight uh, air traffic controller uh, for the FAA. And I had a lot of friends who were corporate pilots, and it was very interesting to see what their job was like. It, and you didn't get to pick ahead of time where you were going. You know, you had the, the, your corporate uh, clients had all kinds of surprise meetings off in Dubai or whatever. That was, that was really pretty interesting. Made it hard to have a personal life, I, I can only imagine. Because mm. plus, of course, you're gone for a week, two weeks on end. So how am I gonna, how am I gonna figure out um, what uh, course I deliver? Because I'm really gonna just set fire to the existing material, burn that, walk away, and start brand new material from the ground up. So when I build new material, it's got to make money. It has to pay off somehow. So I've got to build stuff that's going to appeal for a really long length of time. Um, you know, w. Rossi, so that's a great tie-in. Is this strictly going to be on-prem, or do, are you going to include anything about Azure? So the, the pro and con of building training material about Azure and AWS is that everybody thinks they want to buy it, but it changes so fast. It changes so quickly. The things that make sense in one year don't make as much sense two years or three years down the road. Azure changes the way that they work. AWS changes the way that they work. For the longest time, those changed so fast that it didn't really make sense to build material on them. There are parts of AWS and Azure now that are relatively stable. So for example, AWS EC2 and Azure VMs are stable enough that I can build enough training material on there where it will probably make sense. Oh, big hugger. Uh, so is other, are other people saying that my sound is really awful? And can you be more specific about what the sound is? Because it sound it uh, looks like it's okay on my end. Yeah, so uh, big hugger, you may need to switch, switch uh, speakers, microphones, whatever. Okay, cool. Um, so with that, so the, it all comes down to what do I think the fundamentals should know? What do I think mastering should know? And then how do I want to teach them all of this stuff? So the way that I like to start this is when I'm, when I'm designing a brand new uh, course from scratch is I like to say, all right, what do the people already know? What do they not know? What am I going to teach them in this class? 
and what am I not going to teach them in this class? Because dang, man, if I got a fundamentals course and it's only one day long, I got to scope that thing like nobody's business. Like I'm going to have to put a hard box. Yeah, just early dev, what should they know already, but they don't. Often people don't even know what they don't know. You know, you know that whole saying around known knowns and known unknowns where people know what they know, they know what they don't know, but then they don't know what they don't know. Uh, Sumit says, how can I subscribe to your Slack channel? Um, so you can Google for that and then uh, find that out. Um, it's kind of like the barrier to entry, right? If you can't at least figure out how to get there, then you probably don't belong in the club. Donald, very good. You caught that it's a Donald Rumsfeld quote. Um, so many interesting people in politics and so many great quotes. Oh, it's just I've heard so many good quotes over the last uh, couple of years. All right, so let's let's nail down who our attendee is, who our target attendee is. So I've got a blog post about this. If I go look at... Uh, so target attendee site brandozar.com. I have a post on how to define your presentations attendee. And when I first wrote training classes and presentations, I thought I wanted to get everybody into the to the uh, room, so to speak. I was like a tractor show or a tra um, monster truck show announcer. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at the arena. Everyone, come all, come young. You know, trying to get everyone into the room as much as possible. I don't use that voice for anything in SQL Server, and I probably should. I don't know what I would use that for. I'd have to think about that. Uh, I'll have to think. That could be, I don't want to say resource governor, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, maybe the storage engine. Um, so I, I, I don't want to go, everyone has to know this information. It's for you. Instead, what you want to do when you design a new course is you want to design out the exact specific person who is the person that you're writing this for? And so I like to use names from The Simpsons. So when Bart would call up the bar and he would use a fake name, so like Oliver Close Off, Seymour Butts, Amanda Hug and Kiss, SSIS, that, that's, not a bad, uh, that's not a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> except, of course, obviously, I'm not going to build any training material on SSIS anytime soon. So... Uh, I'm going to write a training profile. I'm going to write a profile of the exact target attendee that I want to catch. And I'm going to define exactly what she knows, exactly what she doesn't know. Um, so I, I, Amanda Hug and Kiss is probably over the, uh, the uh, let's see, Drew P. Wiener, Ivana Tinkle, except that has political uh, implications these days. All right, so let's go see The Simpsons. Uh, Bart Simpson calls bar, asks for name. And then let's go see list of Simpsons crank calls. Perfect. And let's see what the names are. So I'm looking, let's see here. Uh, Jacques Strap, IP Freely, those were all good. Alcoholic, uh, Seymour Butts, Homosexual, yeah, that was kind of amusing. Uh, My Crotch, uh, come on now, give me one that I'll eat a booger. <laughs> Uh, I'm a wiener. Uh, ta -da -da -da. Let's see, Drew P. Wiener. Uh, Yuri Nader. Oh, that's not so bad. Yuri Nader. I don't think I've used Yuri Nader yet. Um, Tess. <laughs> oh, that's so terrible. Uh, let's see, Mr. Buttface. Uh, most hot. Leaky bum. Oh, leaky bum. Oh, okay, it took me a minute there for that. Oh, Monsieur Pants. Pierre Pants. That's kind of odd. That's really weird. I think uh, Mia Butterick said you got a B.O. problem. B.O. problem. Oh, Surly Dev. I'm totally, I'm using that. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, so fundamentals of database administration. Uh, target attendee. And so the name is B.O. problem. I like that. Okay, so what's this tool that I'm working in? Uh, so the tool that I'm working in is Markdown. It is, or the, the script, that, the language that I'm using is Markdown. This particular editor is called Typora. Anita Bath, is Anita Bath we could actually use for the senior DBA class. I'm gonna write that down just so I don't forget it. Anita Bath. Um, 
So this tool is Typora, which lets you do Markdown. For those of you who haven't seen Markdown before, it's a what you see is what you get text editor. And so this way you don't you don't have to use like a big, ugly, bloated app like Microsoft Word. You can get very simple note taking inside here. So <laughs> I haven't st stashed these away in a while. So let's go save this file because I just like to save uh, early and save often. I'm going to go put it under presentations. We're going to say fundamentals of database administration. And now let's start getting to what this person knows. So what she knows, what she doesn't know, uh, what she'll learn, and what she what's off topic, what's off topic or out of scope. So uh, what she knows, uh, she's, a, she's a systems administrator. And I'm, so there are two ways that people come into database administration. They either come in through development tracks or else they come in through systems administration tracks. In this one, I'm specifically going to target systems administrators, people who are Windows admins, network admins, who are gradually segueing their way into managing a SQL server. So she knows systems administration, uh, networking, Windows basics, uh, how to create a VM, um, how to install and troubleshoot Windows. What she doesn't know, how to write a query. And it sounds odd that I would exclude that right from the get-go, but this is one of those foundational things where I go, a, I am not going to teach her how to write a query, and B, when I write anything in this class, I got to make sure that it works even when she doesn't know how to write a query. I can't just say things like, go query a DMV, you know, or go run SP Blitz, because she may not know how to even open, um, uh, she may know how to open Management Studio, but not how to install a stored procedure. So I'm going to say, how to install stored procedures, how to run a query. The other thing that this frees me up to do, when I say that someone doesn't know how to necessarily know how to write a query, run a query, or install a stored procedure, this means that if I'm going to teach them something, I don't have to use SSMS. And you're like, Brent, wait a minute, what the hell? How are you going to teach database administration without SSMS? Buckle up, check this out. So I have had for years, for like, I say I, we have had for years, yes, trigger synonyms, etc. it doesn't matter at all. Now, TG Yak, you say something interesting. What she might know, so possibly PowerShell, and the reason why this is so intriguing when you really start from the ground up is, what do I teach them in? What am I going to, I might be able to pull the whole thing off just with PowerShell, or what if I use a totally separate thing for you, a SQL command? Oh my God, you wouldn't want it. Uh, that's a glutton for punishment. But I love, Anshu, where your thinking is bang on. You could do that if you wanted to. I like how you're thinking like open book. That's or open skies, anything's the limit. That's the exact point of this. So for years, I've had the SQL Server setup checklist. And I say I, there have been a lot of people who've contributed to this through the years. Uh, Jeremiah Peshka, Kendra Little, Jess schultz Borland. I mean, I just, the, the list could go on and on. Um, but inside here, it's always been a PDF that they had to go through. This thing is outdated as hell. This is, last time we touched this was May of 2016. It is 2020 now. And if I'm going to build something and I'm going to make money on it for several years, well, I also want to crumple this thing up, throw it away, and start again from scratch on this as well. To some extent, she doesn't know, Bia uh, uh, O Problem uh, doesn't know uh, the setup checklist or its contents or why you would do it this way. So when I rewrite this, I've always thought when I rewrite this from scratch, the destination shouldn't be a PDF. Because a PDF, if I go in and scroll down through here, go get way down, there's stuff like move TempDB to its own drive. 
Well, this is a query. It doesn't make sense to have a query in a PDF. What makes much more sense is something like Azure Data Studio and a notebook because, so I'm going to put the PDF on the left and the, uh, the Azure Data Studio over here on the right. With an Azure Data Studio notebook, I can put T-SQL code directly inside here. I can have, I can have, I, I, just, I don't know why that never gets old to me when I go and do that. I, as a side note, I'm working on a separate camera. This is going to sound really goofy, but I'm working on a separate camera that, where I can do like the weather person thing, and it can be aimed so that I can uh, walk around the entire screen and point at things. I'm disturbingly excited about that. So in here, I, I love being able to mix documentation and code. This is where the setup guide needs to live. And maybe this is where the entire class needs to live. Because if I'm going to teach B something, I don't know that I want to teach her SQL Server Management Studio. Well, David, she knows Breno's R because she has to find me. She has to find the training course, so I can't assume that she's already found the training course. As a side note, too, it's interesting for business that uh, uh, that uh, how you you have want to build enough marketing material that people know who you are. You want them to repeatedly find you in Google results, and then later over time, they'll buy stuff from you. <laughs> Not the DBA you're looking for, says, uh, I'm disturbingly excited too. Um, the other thing with this, because this is so open source friendly, I think that the next version of this has to be completely open source and it has to be in our first responder kit. Because I want other people to be able to go check in improvements if they want to have something or if they want to fork it off and have a different version as the standard for inside their own companies. It's got to be a living document that I can edit quickly and not worry about uh, having to go dump it to PDF and get it out distributed to people. If it's in Markdown or if it's in Azure Data Studio as a notebook, it's way easier for me to distribute. Plus, I can have these live out on the site. I'm just doing Jim, Jim Van Allen. <laughs> so Stack Pointer is, had also asked an interesting question along the way. Stack Pointer said, would you say it's better to build SQL servers with PowerShell and SQL configuration files? I find it's much more accurate and faster. So this, this comes to another interesting thing. How often does she have to do something? So let's come back to her profile. So what's off topic or out of scope? Automation of repeated activities. I am not going to teach her. Let me see. I think I want to know if I can zoom in on this at all, make it easier for y'all. So can I? Yeah, I can zoom in. Uh, so do, 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 do. Beautiful. Oh, that works nice. Oh, that's kind of spiffy. So this way we'll go ahead and uh, maximize that out. So what's, oh, Rossi, uh, glad to hear it. I uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and Andrea says, I always install demo systems with PowerShell. But remember, she's not installing demo systems. She's a systems administrator who's just trying to manage SQL Server for the first time. This is why building a class is so tough, is having to restrict off. These are the things that are not okay. Um, Nick, I agree with you too. So Nick has the point of it would be nice to have, I, the other thing I would say is parts of notebooks. Like I want to uh, pull part of a notebook in and refresh part of it, but not the whole entire whole thing. Um, Surly Dev says, can I make a suggestion if you're doing it as a checklist, have a table of contents with checkboxes they can tick off. Well, the nice thing, if I go back over to Azure Data Studio, there should just be a validation query that, uh, Anita should be able to just click, or BO, uh, that's right, we're doing this one for BIA. Um, she should be able to run a query and just go, yes, you've passed this step, you're ready for the next one. I don't, there, there, to some extent, there should be manual checkboxes because there will be things that are outside of uh, T-SQL or PowerShell. Things like go to your VM admin and ask for blank, or go ask for the RPO and RTO and go fill that out. So we've got what she knows, what she doesn't know, uh, how to write a query. So this just helps you to, to kind of flesh in and see, or it helps me anyway, to figure out what I'm going to put inside here, what I'm going to put inside over there. So I'm going to say what she doesn't know. Uh, she may not know SQL Server Management Studio. And I'm going to rephrase this out, how to write a query, run a query. I'm just going to say T-SQL, writing, running queries. 
She also doesn't know uh, SP Blitz, or she might know it but not be familiar with it. First responder kit, SP Blitz, SP Blitz first. So what's she going to learn? How to uh, configure a new SQL server, how to uh, configure and test backups, how to do a restore, uh, why and how to check for corruption, how to apply patches, uh, uh, and I'm also going to put in how to configure new SQL server. Um, uh, might be a checklist with ADS notebooks. So this is what she's going to learn. Now, when I'm trying to figure out, yeah, see, that's a great thing. What to do if corruption is found? I'm not going to do that because for B, her uh, mission, because she's, she's going to spend, let's say she spends 50 to 75% of her time doing Windows support and only 25 to 50% of her time doing SQL Server support. Because she doesn't know T-SQL and because she doesn't know how to read and write queries, she also doesn't know anything about indexes, for example. So repairing corruption is going to be off the limits. That will be something that we'll talk through briefly during the mastering class, but it's going to be off the limits for the fundamentals. Because you'll see why... <laughs> Through the, through the course of the morning, as I start to flesh this course out and I start to lay out everything that I have to teach B, you'll start to realize how little time you really have inside a one-day class. If someone doesn't know how to install a SQL Server and set it up according to best practices, for example, and if they've got to configure backups, uh, con corruption checking, and do their first restore with as little data loss as possible, because I'm also going to have to have some discussions around VMs and Azure how those backup tools work, um, then all of a sudden, it's funny how many things fall off limits. When you go to teach classes and do presentations, the hard part isn't figuring out what you're going to teach. The hard part is figuring out what you're not going to teach. Stack says, uh, uh, yes, yeah, see, like the, the Russian name over there, Maxim, uh, sound, looks like how to minimize data loss if corruption occurred totally off the limits. It's too hard. I, first off, I would, I'm, I'm going to have to teach her what corruption is because I'll tell you what, when I was a Windows administrator, the first time that I learned about corruption, I'm like, what, hold it, what, wait, what? You're telling me that SQL Server will sometimes write trash data to disk it won't know, and when it goes to restore, it can't automatically figure that out. What do you mean SQL Server will restore corruption and not know? You know, there's, there's so many things like bugs in SQL Server that will knowingly write trash data to disk. I'm going to be opening up a whole new world. Um, uh, Stack Pointer says, does she need to know about Mac stop, memory config, etc. during the setup? Yes, I'm going to have to teach her, which is also where that Azure Data Studio notebook starts to come in helpful. Like how much can I build into the open source notebook that I don't have to teach her um, versus how much I am going to have to teach her? Um, David says, would you include a where to go for help? That's a great uh, thing. Let's go add that. <laughs> So where to go for community help, uh, or so let's say how to get help, free help from the community, when to escalate to paid help from Microsoft. Best practices for users, logins, and securities I am not going to teach. Um, and I'm glad you said that, though. So security best practices... Um, it be, just because if I'm going to teach something inside of one day for fundamentals, it's beyond what I can totally do. Um, the uh, Anshu, you've already mentioned that a couple of times, Anshu, and I get that you're, that's important to you. I'm not going to cover that here, though. Um, so let's see. So David had said where to go for help section. The reason why I think that this is really like 15, 20 minutes is because I need to explain here's what you need to include whenever you ask for help. And then also if you hit these specific um, issues, uh, corruption is a classic one. If the SQL Server instance won't start. If your business is down and every minute counts, just go pick up the phone and call Microsoft at the same time you're working through community support.
<laughs> no bathrobe, yeah. Um, Nick says, for Maxtop, et cetera, that's where checkboxes are okay, but things you have guidance on and reasons why it's the best value and why for the things recorded, immensely help helpful that follow. This is this is an interesting, uh, Nick, with the Maxtop. Oh, I see, I see exactly. <laughs> I know exactly where you're going with that. I should have a section in here on do not ask Nick Craver for advice on MacStop. Um, so I'm also going to say up here how to document what you did and why, how to make changes to an existing server and save your work so you can repeat it when you build its replacement. Because um, because Nick, you nailed it there with the setting a max memory and max stop. You're going to set, B is going to set it and she's going to forget that she set it when she goes to build the next SQL server. And so the next one that she builds won't be configured the same way and performance will be different. Um, TG says, are you going to go over T-SQL stored procs and functions? No, um, because this is stuff that she doesn't know. T-SQL writing and running queries, that's also outside of the scope of her job, so I'm not going to teach her that. I am going to say down under the what's off topic or out of scope, uh, T-SQL, uh, writing queries, building indexes. Uh, I'll put in here too, recovery from corruption that's more of a Microsoft or senior DBA job. God forbid affinity masking. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and you, oh, that's an interesting, what's out of scope? System databases recovery. Uh, so system database recovery, I would say, is not a fundamentals piece. If for some reason something goes so bad during uh, that SQL server's life that the system databases are hosed, B is the kind of systems administrator who's just going to pave that thing and start over on another SQL server somewhere. So remember, Anshu, start thinking about who B is and what we're going to teach her in one day. I, you're going for some really advanced stuff. This is not, this is all like foreign to be. This is her first time ever going through any SQL Server training whatsoever. What would you teach someone in one day that would be so important that they're going to reuse it again later? That's the thing. Those are things that we're going to focus on there. Um, David says uh, logins and permissions. We did talk about security being out of scope. So I'm going to put that down here. Users, permissions. Uh, it's not that I don't think it's important. It's just that I got to limit the blast radius of what I'm going to try to teach them inside one day. Um, let's see here. Fraud says default and named instances. I think I need to put something up here about that. Um, and I'm going to make it just briefly choosing between default and named instances. I'm also going to say, yeah, DG, exactly. We're nailing the out of scope stuff. Um, oh, Shamville, that's a, a good thing. Uh, event viewer, she knows how to do event viewers. What she doesn't know is how to monitor SQL Server for uptime and serious problems uh, with her existing uh, tools. Um, Anshu, uh, Anshu, I tell you what, you probably want to take a pause on what you're suggesting here and watch what some of the other folks are doing here. Let's think about things you do daily, not things that you did once that you uh, Googled. Um, so basics on SQL versus AD auth uh, is a setup item that, uh, that'll trip up new people. I'm going to mention um, uh, whether to enable SQL auth, but in terms of choosing between which login you should use, she doesn't do the development and she's, she is dealing with SQL servers that other people write the apps for, and they're probably going to dictate, I need a SQL login for that, I need an AD login for that, etc. So I'm just totally going to knock that out. We're not going to go anywhere near that. Um, DB Augie says, have you looked at uh, Jupyter Notebooks as a way to document and replay the SQL Server build? Welcome to the chat. You're about 20 minutes behind. So when you get time, you can rewatch. And we talked about the thing over here on the right-hand side, right behind me. Where can you not see what's on the screen? Um, so TJ Yak says log filtering. This is this is why I get in trouble. This is also why cranky old bastard likes to watch me work. Um, so SQL logs, yeah, I, I do have inside here how to monitor SQL Server for uptime and serious problems, and I'm 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 going to say out of scope is performance. So performance, 
monitoring, weights, uh, troubleshooting. Oh, you know what we need for um, uh, how to triage an emergency. How to triage an emergency. Um, is the SQL server down? What can I do to get it back up safely? Um, when to start the service up? Where to look uh, in logs if it won't start? Um, ports and protocols, I'd say, is... Um, oh, agent basics. Oh, yes, Nick, that's a good one, yes. Basics, uh, when to use jobs, when not to. Um, I am going to say something. <laughs> not the DBA you're looking for says, I want this person's job. Um, Anshu, that's good, actually. Recovery model, that's very good. I like that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that in here in a second. Um, so, <laughs> but that, that is very good. Now you're on exactly the right track. Um, fraud says, is ports and protocols too deep? I would say, yeah, probably for, for her. She's going to be given a, th a uh, here we need to connect to SQL Server, and she's probably just going to turn on TCP and call it a day. Um, so I love the agent basics because it makes me think of something else. What's in scope for the how we do backups? Y'all are very smart. The people in this room, you are not B, but you're great at being B's mentor. You are going to want B to use Ola Hollingren's maintenance scripts. And I'm torn. I don't know if I should. Because remember, B doesn't know T-SQL. And to troubleshoot things like Ola Hollingren scripts, B would need to know T-SQL. And I might need to just stick with maintenance plans for the scope of this. And I know you're not going to be happy about that. I know you're going to be disappointed, but that's what the fundamentals class is for me. If I'm going to get somebody across the finish line in one day, setting up Ola Hollingren stuff and, and testing it and using it successfully, that might be teetering on the edge of what I can pull off in one day. It kills me because I'm with you. I, I really love Ola's stuff. Uh, the catch is, is it's, it's just so hard to, when I'm going to teach somebody stuff in one day. And this also says, you know, I, I've made an assumption here that fundamentals is a one-day class and mastering is a three-day class. If you were going to go build your own scripts, you could to or your, build your own classes, you could totally do a fundamentals class that's like three days long. But one of the things that I've learned is that people have a really hard time getting uh, payoff approval for a, a three-day class when it's their first class. I want this to be like a hundred bucks, uh, 200 bucks, and have them be able to even spring it on their own card if they wanted to. And you remember we said T-SQL's off limits. We're not going anywhere near T-SQL. Okay, so I love oh mentioning it in the in the environment. That's probably good. Um, stack pointer: How to handle devs blaming every problem on SQL Server. You know what's also out of scope? This is because it's interesting. Is production versus development? <laughs> I like how fraud says a one day class could be fifteen hours. Yeah, but you forget that I have to take bio breaks and whatnot too as well. Um, David says she would need to grant someone access, so creating sysadmins for the last time. I won't say this again from now on. I'll just ignore those messages. Security is off limits for the purposes of this class. Just there's only so much I can teach you, and as soon as I open security, there goes an entire day, and I just can't get there. Really, what I'm really worried about is making sure that B can feel confident in saying, I am comfortable managing this server, just like I'm comfortable managing the SharePoint server or the file server or I don't even know that people still do email servers these days. I don't know, why would you? <laughs> so in here, so there were a couple of good things that came in inside there. So for how to, uh, how to do backups, we're going to say, or for out of scope, um, I'm going to say Ola Hall, and that also includes Ola Hollingren's maintenance scripts, but we will touch on them. Ooh, index maintenance. Um, Next maintenance, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, so, uh, so Malik, we already said system databases, we're not going to go near. Um, but there, one of you said, who was it? It was um, Anshu. Anshu said um, uh, full versus recovery, or uh, full versus simple recovery model, what to choose when. 
so, and we're going to use maintenance plans uh, for this course. We'll mention Ola in case she has T-SQL experience or starts to learn. Uh, let's see here. Ape uh, says, could she use Azure Data Studio and its extensions? Go ahead and rewatch the archive when you get a chance and you can uh, catch up to speed. We talked about that already. Oh, yes. No, Nick, that is actually really good. So high, and under high availability, disaster recovery replication for this class, we're going to assume B only has single instance servers. Uh, ideally VMs. Now, as I, I'll tell you something else. Now, as we start to talk about uh, this class and its challenges, I don't know that we can hit cloud. Um, Rich, I'm, I'm going to, antivirus is one of those political things where usually B doesn't have control over it, but I am going to say under the configuration, I am going to say um, uh, antivirus exclusions and link to the MSKB article, because Microsoft has a KB article. It just makes it really easy. So that's, that's a really good thing to add inside there. Um, and she says types of SQL services and uh, the engine and browser services, I think beginners should know, right, but she's not going to do that often. Remember, think about Anshu. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and take a tea and time out there. Um, Stack Pointer says, is patching out of scope? No, it's actually in scope there. I like that quite a bit. Um, he, 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 he. Uh, and he is correct. Uh, yeah, a couple of you have said patching. That's up on the screen. Um, Shamville has it. Okay, so Shamville, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm scrolling back and catching Shamble's one on uh, um, Facebook. Architecture of the SQL database engine. Personally, I don't understand it when it was new, but many say that it's important. Um, I, I misread your comment, and I thought it was Azure SQL DB at first. So this this is one where I'm uh, the architecture of the engine. I'm not going to get into in here because it's performance. But the thing I was excited about when I saw your comment was choosing between Azure SQL DB and uh, VMs. So I'm going to give a 15 minute thing for her. So very short. Uh, when to choose Azure SQL DB versus installing it yourself in a VM, only because I think she needs to know. Uh, oh, quick basics of additions. Um, I'm going to put that up in the how to configure, uh, which uh, install to choose. Uh, dev, standard, EE, and then EE core, because I think that a lot of people don't know the core limited one, and this is the kind of thing that B would go and grab, not understanding that it's limited to 20 cores, the, the old enterprise edition, the bad installer. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, cranky old bastard licensing, I dare you. Do you know what, cranky old bastard? That's actually in scope. Yes, uh, licensing. I think that that's very important because I, I actually happen to be a licensing freak. I think I can teach B in 15 to 20 minutes the things that are the most important to her for licensing. I think it'll work. Malik, registered servers are CMS. That's a really good question, and I'm going to move up to the top and talk about she has one to two SQL servers. I don't know why I put that in all caps. She has just one to two uh, production SQL servers, uh, no high availability or disaster recovery, most likely um, in virtual machines. Her company doesn't need enough performance that they're on bare metal. Um, I, I love having that line in there that her company doesn't need enough performance that they're on bare metal because it also knocks out some of the stuff that I used to teach around uh, how do you format an NTFS allocation your, and choose the right NTFS allocation units during, during startup that just, or during installation. That just doesn't matter that much these days. You'll hear people go, oh my God, it matters passionately. Not for people like B. B's not in that uh, land yet. Now, Ape has a good uh, thing, server migrations. I'm going to put that off limit. Uh, also, whiskey. Uh, I'm going to put that off limit, but I think it's really interesting for the, the senior one. Server migrations. I think that is really interesting there. 
Uh, let's see, was there anything else that I needed to hit? Okay, good. I think that we've got a, a good rundown there. The next thing that I'm going to do, so I have this, the notebook up there. I'm going to close that just because we've talked about it. I'm going to come back over to our SQL Server setup checklist, and I'm going to scan through there to see if there's anything uh, else that I missed. Doesn't everyone already know that? If not, I'm the, certainly the world's most qualified person to teach that. <laughs> Uh, so let's see here. Oh, well, yeah, let's see. What's in the setup guide? RAID, I'm not teaching RAID. I'm not teaching. Oh, yeah. When to put, let's move this over here just so that I can, uh, well, no, we'll move it over here. Let's, architecture decisions where I put which things. Um, it's, uh, the, one of the things that, that immediately caught my eye inside there was um, up top, where do you put the thing on like C drive, D drive? Not the DBA says we're looking for us. So we renamed the SQL Server Checklist to Bible. There was a an author, or there is an author, Paul Nielsen, who originally wrote a SQL Server Bible. I'm just going to say as a, as a short thing, don't use religious terms for uh, technical checklists because it turns people off who are super religious and also people who hate religion. So if you, any time that you do something and you get people on both extremes mad at you, that's a pretty quick way to get yourself in trouble. So maybe don't use that. Uh, let's see here. So get, where, where to install it. So this was also interesting. So uh, which drives to install it on? SQL Dev DBAs is the DAC. I'm not going to do that only because it's going to be in the checklist. I think it'll be in the checklist. And remember, she doesn't even know how to run a query. Um, so I might, uh, using the DAC is something that is so fairly rare for most database administrators that I'm going to hold that for the mastering class. I'm going to put down that it's in the exclusions. Uh, so uh, the DAC and troubleshooting when SQL Server won't respond to connection requests. Uh, so the install and where the data goes, I, I just wrote, so which drives to install it on, uh, tempdb, location, configuration, data file, uh, location, configuration, should logs and data go on separate drives, just because that's one of those urban legends that keeps coming up. Um, Naveen says blocking and deadlocks. I'm going to call that off topic only because performance, and I'm going to put this in down here as well. So let's move it. Uh, locking, blocking, uh, SP who is active. I'm going to put all those as off topic inside here. Uh, cranky old bastard. Yeah, we'll talk about that. I have an installation checklist or an installation part up there. I think you're thinking probably like cost threshold and max stop, which uh, my first thought, my brain's going a million miles an hour. When you talk about defaults not to accept, what version is B going to be installing? I'm going to assume, I'm going to roll with the starting assumption that she's going to be only installing 2017 or newer. So why would I make a decision like that? When I do all the screenshots, all the installation checklists, I'm going to assume 2017 or newer, and I'm going to link to her just to somewhere else. If you have to install an older version, here are things to think about, but I'm not going to cover them inside the course, only because SQL Server starts getting better uh, over the years. No, I am not. Are you a whale? So. Uh, coming back over here. So let's say up in the top, her, uh, and I'm going to move this over here just because I'm going to spend a lot of time over in that doc. Um, Moby Dick, why am I flapping with my hands? Uh, because I'm trying to avoid giving you the finger. So uh, she, when installing new servers, she's using SQL Server 2017 or newer. Uh, use that for the screenshots and only briefly talk about other versions. Uh, TempDB memory settings. TempDB doesn't have memory settings, Merka. So uh, memory concepts, we're also not going to go near anywhere near there. Um, so uh, SQL Dev DBA says, is TempDB installed in the checklist? That is right here. So we got that right here. Uh, now it's come up. I'm not going to go near physical network cards because I'm going to assume that she's using a virtual machine. Um, same thing with provisioning storage for the OS. Um, I'm going to say Windows 
settings to change, tweak during setup. I'm specifically thinking of the page file, the OS drive size, um, in the event that she has to give a Moby Dick. No, I gave you two mental fingers. But um, ooh, David, would you give an overview of components like SSIS, uh, full text indexing, and uh, analysis services? That's interesting because I'm going to say um, which components to choose don't include components that you're not actively using. There's an overhead to leaving SSIS, RSAS running, and you expose yourself to someone relying on those and then causing performance problems later. Like if somebody wants those, I'm going to say that B should make them ask for it. Ah, uh, da, da 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 I do have a thing on default on instances, Nick, that I'd have a line in there briefly already. I'm not going to scroll around just because I've got it. Um, Naveen, oh, that's interesting. Um, MSDB and how to check the last backup details. I have a line in here on um, how to configure and test backups. Uh, how to see backup reports, uh, especially if you're using a VM snapshot tool and it's not quiescing SQL servers writes. Because I've run into so many sysadmins who think that a VM snapshot from something that isn't quiescing SQL servers writes is going to be good enough, and then they learn the hard way whenever they go to restore it. This is not a slam against, uh, so if just in case our Genis Fernandez happens to uh, see this in some way, shape, or form, that is not a slam against pure software or pure storage. That's totally different. That's totally okay. Um, uh, and Shamble, yes, VM level snapshots and their effect on SQL connections. Yeah, I, I'm going to make sure that they're only doing SQL server backups. Um, Gotham, I've got a line for that about separating storage. That's in there already. Um, I think that's good. Okay, good. Uh, so let's come back over here. Provisioning from storage. Uh, let's see here. Design your backup strategy. RPO and RTO, I'm going to talk about inside the backups part. This is just old. Um, configuring the page file, that's all okay. This is just old. This is part of this here is why, why I wanted to dump the course. Um, and uh, Marika, that's not that's performance, and we're going to uh, not do performance inside this course. This, this, this right here in the checklist is really the big part of why I started looking at this document, and I'm like, oh my god, this is so out of date, and I need to do it. Uh, Black White Life says, is the course for free? No, unfortunately. Sad reality is that I have to make a living. Oh, man, can you believe that? Mm. So any uh, uh, TempDB contention is performance, and we've uh, mentioned a couple times we're not going to go uh, for performance. Um, Malik says the SQL built-in reports, but the thing is, I may not teach this course with Management Studio, because really, at the end of, yeah, and Nick, at the end of all my courses, I've been doing that these days, at the end of every module, I give them a list of, now, here's where you would want it. For, I'm like, for people who bought this module, also bought, you know, things that they want to go and learn uh, uh, after that. Uh, let's see here. Moby Dick says it's illegal to flip the bird in many countries. Well, it's a good thing I'm in America, where I'm allowed to do this all day. Oh, I, I didn't raise it quite high enough. Randy, welcome to the club, and thank you. Uh, so let's see here. Selecting the components, TCP. Instant file initialization, because that's a checkbox these days, I don't really need to dedicate any time to that. I'll just have it as, hey, check this box, and here's why. Um, woo! All kinds of Gotham. Welcome to the club. Thank you. Uh, Naveen says how to backup. Yep, we've got the backups uh, listed inside there. Ooh, Nick, that is a good point. Um, where is my installation section? So there you go. Uh, service accounts. Now, that's separate from security, obviously, but I do, if B is going to be configuring this, I do want to say, hey, B, go create a new AD account just for this SQL server, um, and then uh, go create a new service account for this particular SQL server, um, and don't share the name or password with anybody else, you know, keep it locked down. That That is actually good, because I'll use it for assigning uh, permissions to the backup file shares. 
Uh, dot max degree of parallelism and data and log file growth. Ah, that's an interesting one. Data and log file growth. I don't know if I'm going to cover that. Um, I don't, th I'm going to make a tough uh, call on that one. Um, you know, but it brings me to an interesting thing. Um, so what, how big are her servers? Her databases are, uh, her, her SQL servers have a total of under uh, 50 gigabytes of data. And I know you're all like, oh my God, that's tiny. But hold on, remember, so population report. If I go look at the population report that we put out for SQL Constant Care and come down here and I look at sizes of databases, uh, so, and I'll do this one instead. So this gives you a rough idea of how large people's SQL servers are. All, half of all SQL servers out there in SQL Constant Care are 125 gigs or less. That's going to be where my focus is for this one. So I'm actually going to say that. So I'm going to say her SQL servers have 125 gigs or less of her data, matching the 50% of servers under SQL Constant Care. Uh, da, da. Um, so that uh, Nagaraj, Nagaraj says dry form format allocation. No, 64K isn't really accurate these days with uh, the modern cloud stuff, VMs, etc. It's less important. Um, cranky old bastard. Yes, I'm going to touch on log file backups. Uh, Nick says growth is worth mentioning, at least regards to TempDB. I am going to put in TempDB file size. I'm going to say, because I had a line in here about configuring TempDB file location and configuration. I'm going to mention emergency vent valve file for TempDB. I'm a, a huge believer in uh, having one extra TempDB data file on some other volume with a huge amount of space, just in case all hell breaks loose. Okay, uh, so that's back over on here. I'm not worried about that. Setting up the maintenance we already talked about. We're not going to talk about that. Um, no, uh, Naveen, we're not going to do performance at all. Listen carefully. We're not, as, I'm just going to ignore those from here on out. Uh, so DTC, linked servers are off scope. I'm going to say linked servers are out of scope. Because she has so few, uh, we're going to leave that off. Database mail. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, so let's see here. Database mail for basic alerting. Uh, we want that. And then do, 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 do. That's good. Um, CLR components. God, no. Okay, perfect. All right, good. So I think yeah, I'm going to zoom back to normal size, actual size. So when I zoom back into here, the stuff that I have already for a one day class, we're already looking at, I should have done this as a uh, do, 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 do. Um, they, we're already looking at a huge amount of stuff that we're going to try and teach her inside a one day class. I think that we're at a good point here where I'm going to have to start breaking this stuff out and figuring out what I'm going to do inside 45 minute modules. So I don't think I'm going to be able to cover all of them or everything that we've got inside here. Generally speaking, <laughs> when I'm doing a class, I think of a one day class as six. 45 minute modules and you're like Brent that's not even six hours I know because I have to have hands-on exercises I want to have B actually go run things against her own SQL server and learn stuff so that she knows what work she has to do at the end of this class I actually want her to have a checklist of here are the things that I need to go do in order in my existing environment because we focused a lot on what to do with brand new SQL servers. And uh, B's got a couple that she already has. And she's like, oh, snap, my stuff inside here doesn't match the, the things that he's telling me to do. What should I do for it? OK, so I'll stop here for a second and give a shout out to our sponsor. <laughs> 
So this week, my sponsor is Quest Software. Quest is doing an Ask the Experts uh, webcast with me and Panal, where we do totally open uh, questions and answers. We'll take questions from the audience. A bunch of people have already submitted questions from registering. If you go to brentozar.com slash go slash experts, you can sign up for the totally free webcast. And if you can't make it on June the 24th during the live one, registering will also get you access to the recording. This will not be out on YouTube. This will be a totally private one that's just done for folks who signed up through Quest. So go to brentozar.com slash go slash experts in order to sign up for that. So we've been going at this for uh, around about an hour now. I'm going to take a short bio break. I'm going to take a five minute bio break, go refuel my coffee and my water. And then when we come back, the next thing that I'm going to shift gears into is the mastering class. So now we're going to take the same level. We're going to pretend that B graduated from that fundamentals class. And now she spends a much higher percentage of her time. Well, it'll be uh, Anita Bath, I think, is our next uh, name from Surly Dev. Uh, Anita Bath. And so what does Anita Bath already know, not know, and what does she need to know? And I know a big one for her is going to be high availability and disaster recovery, architecture, stuff like that. So five minute bio break and I'll see y'all back in here. We will be right back. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okie dokie, welcome back. So in our, <laughs> when last we met, uh, when last we met, we were doing the designing the course fundamentals of database administration. And now we're going to switch over and design mastering database administration. It's really funny when you when you start taking this one, it's basically everything that was out of scope suddenly becomes now in scope. And another thing is basically anything that uh, I taught B in the last class is considered to be something that she already knows. Eamon says, when are these classes expected to be available? I don't I don't like release dates or anything like that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly when I'll get them out, and it, a lot of it depends on the workload that I have on my day job, quote unquote. I tend to use, whenever I have time that isn't booked by consulting clients, then I tend to use that for building training material when the, when the virus hit. So when the virus hit, it was a, uh, such a shock. It's changed so many things about business, and Erica and I were off in Iceland having a great time. We decided to come back to the United States. And at the time when I came back to the United States, the we were on one of the last flights out of Iceland on regularly scheduled airline stuff. Erica and I were literally the only people in the first class lounge. It was a giant, huge first class lounge in Reykjavik. Uh, Iceland Air has this mount monster, it's their home airport, huge first class lounge. And the entire bar, for example, probably sat 100 people at this bar. The entire bar was empty. There was no bartender. They go, you can just make whatever drinks you want. All, everything was unlocked, the wine, the booze, everything totally open. You could have anything that you want. Now, granted, at first class lounges, it's never usually expensive. It's like the base red wines and white wines are free, and then the well drinks are free. But anything, you could have anything you wanted because it was cheaper for them to do that than it was to pay a bartender to be there. And the woman, as we came in to the lounge, she said, you know, you're literally my first people today. She said, I'm really sorry, but there's no hot food. She said, there's all kinds of cold food out there. She's like, I deeply apologize. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like I get my own first class lounge. Now, it was super creepy. You know, it was very strange when we were out there. But that kind of set the stage for as we were coming back to the States, uh, that you know, different things were going to be really different. Your business was going to be different. And I thought, okay, this is to some extent great. I'm going to have a wide open calendar to work on training. I'd be able to have all this time to work on training material. That didn't happen at all. It ended up being really weird, totally shifted and ended up working my rear end off because I ended up getting a lot of clients who uh, the, the virus accelerated their business Remote payment firms are a great example. If you take remote payments, all of a sudden nobody's using cash anymore. Everybody's doing remote or contactless payments. Um, so I ended up having businesses who needed a scale in a hurry. I didn't. I didn't end up writing that much new stuff. Um, I did end up doing a fundamentals, my new fundamentals and mastering parameter sniffing courses, and that, that I worked a lot of long, late uh, days and hours trying to get that done. Um, but this now, like as I'm writing this, I have no idea when I'm going to ship these courses. I don't know if it's going to be before our Black Friday sales or after our Black Friday sales. 
right now, I would actually show you my calendar, except there's client names on it. Um, right now, I'm running about 75% booked through uh, Black Friday. Um, but we'll see how things go, you know, just because stuff shifts gear all the time. Um, it, the whole reason I'm doing this is that I want to be able to announce new classes on Black Friday and have them all ready to go and have the first delivery start then. Um, if, uh, if I can bring them out earlier, great. I'd love to be able to do that. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, Nick says, I'd love a dev side course on that parameter sniffing and other potential code smells. You know, it was really funny when I went to Iceland. So Erica and I took, uh, we we're going to originally take a month and a half off and just go drive around the ring road in Iceland. I brought with me a visual studio books, you know, online, obviously, and had visual studio code, uh, and visual studio all installed on my laptop. Cause what I thought I was going to do on that vacation was I was going to write a C sharp guide for SQL server. I was going to say, for those of you doing entity framework, uh, here's the bare essentials of what you need to know about things like parameter sniffing, uh, how to use explicit uh, variable data types rather than using add with example, um, uh, how to make sure that you're pulling down data quickly instead of operating on it row by row, what are the right data types to choose. And we got like a week into the vacation. We got like a week in and the virus stuff was so big, we couldn't do anything other than read about that and talk about that. We, uh, I couldn't learn anything. I couldn't uh, absorb new skills. I couldn't isolate myself and just do Visual Studio work. Erica and I found ourselves when we weren't driving around Iceland, we were reading the news and just digest it. Cause it was like, it was like living in a science fiction novel. And we're like, this can't be happening. This is insane. And, uh, so that, that pretty well just eliminated my ability to learn, but that was where I was going to go with 2020 was I was going to focus on visual studio and building courses for developers. So then I came back. And I'm like, okay, I'm not, I can't pull off Visual Studio this year. You know, I just couldn't narrow my focus and get in on that. So I'm like, how can I teach the stuff I already know and just like get that out the door to make more money on that, like passive income, rather than learn new stuff that then I would have to turn around and build material on. Uh, but I, I want, I'm saying this because I want to deliver that. Like there will be some point in my life, if someone hasn't already done that course, I'm going to do that course. Um, I don't ever want to learn Visual Studio for the purposes of building an app again. Like my days as a developer are just long gone. I suck at that. Uh, but I would love to be able to teach that. So there you go. And and Pete had said during the break, too, I love these inside baseball uh, sessions. That's exactly the term that I use. I always think of it as inside baseball, where y'all get to see what's going on inside my end of the business and why I make some of the decisions that I uh, make. Um, Nick, yeah, you're, it was gorgeous, just utterly gorgeous. And so Erica and I are already scheduling. I want to say it's March. Uh, I'm going to go look at my calendar just to go see when do we fly out? So our lease is up here in San Diego in um, February. Yeah, February. So we're moving out of here. We're hiring movers and all of our stuff will be gone. I'm never lifting anything. Get in my life. I'm too old for that. Um, but so we, we're hiring movers. All our stuff goes into storage in February. And then from the end of February through um, the end of May, so all of March, April, and May, we're going to be in Iceland the whole time. And uh, so, you know, when I vacation, I vacation. Um, so because we kept going there and we wanted to stay longer and longer periods of time. This time we're renting a house. Uh, we've been working with the person who owns the house. It turns out like 90% of Iceland is covered with gig fiber, symmetric gig fiber. Uh, so you get both gig upload and download. And when I read that, I'm like, come on. You're serious. Can I have that in San Diego? But that's like super rare to get in the United States. So we're talking to this person who has this house in Iceland that we wanted to rent out in the middle of nowhere. Like you need binoculars to see your neighbors. You know, it's big mountains and, and lakes and all that. And she's like, oh, yeah, we have uh, we have gig fiber at our house up the road. We just haven't put gig fiber in at that house yet. And so she's putting gig fiber in and you know, ran the tests and all that. I'm like, oh, my God, this is phenomenal. So I can teach classes from there. Woo! Yes! I love it! It's fantastic! Mm. Um, 
Jim says I do C++, MFC, COM, ADO. See, I wouldn't, I wouldn't teach any of those classes, though. Like, I'm not going anywhere near C++ or anything like that. So that should be fun. So now let's uh, switch over and do the mastering class. Yeah, Richard says I'm rocking 500-500 uh, fiber outside Chicago. Well, I'll show you a bandwidth test. Let me get my, make sure that I don't have anything private up there on the... Um... <laughs> On the uh, monitor. Uh, Spitfire, they're on my Twitch channel. If you go to twitch.tv slash Brent Ozar and then you scroll down, there are the mugs there. So you can go buy those mugs uh, over on my Twitch channel and hoodies, hats, all that kind of thing. Uh, so let's see, bandwidth test. And the funny part is that I'm doing a bandwidth test at the same time that I am streaming to y'all. I'm streaming high definition video and audio, of course, at the same time I'm doing this. Now, that also means my stream might suffer while I'm doing this. We'll see uh, how this goes. Or it may not go at all. All right, so that's cool. Evidently, that's not going to work. Oh, fast. Okay, yeah, so let's try that instead. Uh, so fast.com. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, and that is the part that I really love. That is phenomenal. That is just great. I love that. Um, so it makes streaming so much easier. So then I, nor, I, I would love to go vacation in Mexico for a few months, take a few months off and teach from there. You ain't never getting, you know, 800 megabytes uh, uh, or megabit per second uh, up out of there. So I never remember. I always say the wrong thing whenever it's megabytes or megabits. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I will totally take that. All right, so MasterCore, good to see you. So now we have, we've got the one for fundamentals of database administration. Now let's go do the one for mastering. So I'm going to now start a new one. And I'm going to say Mastering Database Administration. And our target attendee for this one, Anita Bath. That's right. Uh, target attendee is Anita Bath. Thanks, Surly Dev. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I got to have those names or else. I mean, because you want to be able to laugh whenever you're looking at stuff like this. Um, so she has already attended Fundamentals of Database Administration spends 50% of her time working on SQL Server, is the only SQL Server person in her shop, doesn't have an official DBA title yet, or does she? I'm going to say she does. Um, has, just, has just recently uh, attained... Oh, I don't. Oh, sorry about that, Surly Dev. Oh, um, has just recently attained the title of DBA in her job, but feels like an imposter. Never been to a uh, two, three day training class on database administration. Uh, so what she knows. Now, before we said that B over in the other window didn't know querying, I'm going to assume that Anita does. So knows T-SQL, uh, SQL Server Management Studio, First Responder Kit, SP Blitz, SP Blitz First. Um, I'm going to say her servers, her, her servers, she has um, her... 10 to 20 SQL servers have as much as one terabyte of data. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, 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 I'm going to say that some are deep uh, familiarity with uh, apps and workload. She also knows the basics of weight stats. Um, SP who is active. Uh, now, this, this is interesting because, oh, let me go uh, save this. I'm, I'm in the habit of hitting Control-S all the time, but uh, Mastering Database Administration. Uh, save. Uh, 
Um, so there's a gap in here between these two. There's stuff that the uh, that B didn't know during fundamentals, and I didn't teach her, and I'm making a leap when I go up to mastering database administration. You might think that if you're designing a training course that they perfectly have to hand off between one and the other, but the reality is that B isn't going to spend 200 bucks on this train on her le uh, uh, far left hand side fundamentals course. She's not going to spend 200 bucks on that and then immediately walk over and buy the mastering class. She's going to take some time before she does that. And my goal, of course, in the fundamentals course is I want to give her as much free runway to go, all right, here you've learned a bunch of these basics. Now here's a free runway. Exactly. Some self-training was done, and I want to make sure that it's free. I want to give her a runway and a path to go, here are things that you can learn for free. In the year 2020, no one should be paying any money to learn things like SP Who is Active. It's just a world standard out there, lots of free videos on it. So I'm going to assume that a lot of free self-training was done. Uh, so she knows that. I'm going to hold off on what she's going to learn, but I'm going to talk about what's out of scope. So in here, we talked about in the last one, stuff that was out of scope for repeated activities. And the first thing that was out of scope for uh, in the last one was automation of repeated activities. Let me stop for a second. What, when I stopped teaching the senior DBA class, so I used to teach the senior DBA class as an in-person thing. I used to also do it online. When I stopped teaching that, and I told the students this, I said, I think that I would feel like a fraud in the year 2017, 18, if you have a class called the senior DBA class and it doesn't include PowerShell. I think that if you're going to be a senior DBA in the year 2020, you have to know PowerShell. I don't know PowerShell because I don't do PowerShell. I don't do, I don't need to automate things across 10 or 20 SQL servers because I'm a database administrator who gets the luxury of working on one server at a time. I don't have to troubleshoot the cluster. I don't have to go build a cluster, things like that anymore. So now when I start sketching out the layout of this course, do I teach PowerShell? Hell no, because I can't ask a question. I know that there are people out there who will go grab training material off the rack, like Microsoft certified trainers, who will take a course from Microsoft and just read the stuff from the book. All right, everyone, now turn to page 14 and we will build a polybase. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm never going to be that guy. I only want to teach things that I either actively use or else I can at least answer questions on. PowerShell isn't going to be it. So how do I talk about, uh, or, or in mastering database administration, I need to set a shell of these are the things you're going to learn, these are the things you're not going to learn. I am not going to teach automation of repeated activities inside this class. I will totally give links to that, but I got to make sure to make it clear when people go by the course that they shouldn't expect that, that that's not going to be something that we go and tackle. <laughs> So inside here, if I go look at what's out of scope, we're going to say automation of, oops, let me move it back up again so that y'all can see where I'm at. Um, so oh, here, we'll just copy paste in uh, the stuff that was out of scope, and we're going to start talking about what's now in scope. So is Ola Hollingren's maintenance scripts in there? I'm going to assume that she already knows them. So I'm going to cut that up, and I'm going to put it up here under what she already knows. What this also tells me is that this is something that I need to have a free blog post on, that I need to go either an Azure Data Studio notebook or something. I'm going to assume that she already knows them, which another way to say that is I'm not going to sell training on that. So I should write this. And whenever you're a blogger and you're looking for topics, go Google for things that there are paid training material on. Those are things that you could write a blog post on. Because if somebody's willing to shell out 200 bucks in order to learn something and you could teach them for free, that's phenomenal. Um, so you know, Nick says, agree on not, not teaching PowerShell, but mentioning that many server operations are available through it and the docs have equivalent examples. Yes, absolutely, yeah. I want to be able to say, here's how I'm going to do this here. Here's how to go do it with PowerShell. Uh, so let's see here. So what? So we talked about what's out of topic, or we took the uh, things from Ola's. Um, security best practices is absolutely in scope here. So let's say what she's going to learn. 
um, security best practices, linked servers. Uh, so users, least privilege, uh, linked server, linked server queries. Uh, the, the thing I want to say, I'm not, I'm not going to talk performance, but not performance. Uh, but I do think it's vital that someone who's mastering database administration knows the risks of linked server queries, especially the way the permissions are set up. Because over and over again, I see people who set up a high level security uh, user for their linked servers, not realizing that anybody who can query the server then has access to those uh, permissions. <laughs> I'm not setting the SSA password, SA, and other hot tips. Uh, let's see here. So we got security best practices. I'm not going to teach T-SQL inside here. No. <laughs> um, recovery from corruption, totally in scope. That is now totally in scope. That is absolutely. Um, and uh, there will be an exercise, a lab for that. Um, and I'm putting labs in here because in the mastering classes, I try to alternate between uh, lecture or two, hands-on lab, lecture or two, hands-on lab. And with a recovery from corruption lab, I can totally give Anita uh, her choice between three databases, and I'll explain the three databases with differing levels of corruption. So depending on how familiar she is with recovering from corruption, she'll have a few different options on how hard she wants to make her lab. System database recovery is absolutely in scope. Um, why I believe you should never do this and what you should do instead, fail over. Um, high availability disaster recovery is absolutely in scope. This is going to be huge. Server migration is going to be in scope. The DAC is going to be in scope. Okay, good. So we're just going to cut and paste all that stuff back up there. Um, linked servers, we are going to talk about. Performance is not going to be in scope. Yes, Masticore uh, disaster recovery will totally be up in scope, and I'm going to have to flush out this entire line. Like, that's going to become probably a day or two days of the class. Who knows, depending on how this goes. Um, the stuff that's out of scope down there, I'm still not going to go anywhere near performance, only because I have separate classes for that, and I'll just say inside here. Uh, that's covered extensively in the existing mastering classes. Okay, good. Um, so now, assuming that she already knows everything over on the left side, the fundamentals class, she's already nailed all this stuff down. So I'm going to minimize, oops, I'm going to minimize that. And then I'm going to go over to my existing uh, training class. So I'm going to go over to my existing senior DBA class. Actually, you know what? I should open both of them. Um, let's go look at the contents of both the fundamentals class. Um, oh, uh, being familiar with NOLA scripts and whether to run index maintenance and with what values. What class does that fit in? That's in mastering index tuning. Um, but I agree that it should probably be in here too. My thing is, if she doesn't know... Uh, when or where to defragment indexes in the first class, that's okay. Like it doesn't hurt anything if she doesn't know it. It's not like her performance is going to be crippled. But by the time she gets up into mastering, then I kind of got to know. So let's say, uh, put it in and down here, uh, pros and cons of doing index maintenance uh, and using the right settings for Ola. Um, also, how this affects HADR with log replication. Uh, which brings me to another thing, what's out of scope? Transactional replication. Uh, any kind of replication like transactional, snapshot, and merge. Not going anywhere near that. That was the wrong sound effect. It was supposed to be the sad trombone. I will live with that. Uh, so let's go back over now to the two existing classes that we have. So in these existing classes, so now first I'm in the existing fundamentals class. I'm like, all right, is there anything out of here that I missed in the original fundamentals class that I think is important? You know what's really important is oops, deletes. Oh my God, oops, deletes is way harder than it looks. Everybody thinks that they know how to do that and they do not. Um, so recovery from corruption, uh, restoring uh, for oops, delete. Uh, really, you know what, I'm gonna go deeper into backups. So let's say, uh, advanced backup and recovery, uh, making backups and restores go faster. 
restoring from oops deletes and then that uh, so restore with standby I'm not going to cover that uh, okay those are all cool shrinking files um, I am not going to cover that inside fundamentals um, I'm not uh, Anshu, tail of the log backup. Yes, absolutely. That is a great point. Anshu, now, Anshu, now you have met your course. Now is the moment you can shine all those trivial things that you were interested in earlier. Now, suddenly, that matters. Uh, tail of the log backups. Uh, why the hell would you put the wear clause at the end? <laughs> yes, yes, that is good. Okay, so now we know that. Uh, now we're off to the senior DBA class. So this is the stuff that I used to teach in the senior DBA class and where a lot of this stuff has morphed, uh, started to morph over time. Now I got to take a look at some of these and see what's going on here. Ooh. Mm. Mm. Yeah, okay, I already have a section on uh, uh, architecture. So in building and testing, one of my favorite things inside building and testing was like, look, before you go live, you need to perform these tests against a SQL server and you need to document the failover process. So I'm just going to say tests you have to run before you go live. Uh, planned, unplanned failovers, failing back, and documentation. Um, page anatomy, not at all, because performance is out of scope. So and you're, God bless you, you really love page anatomy. But performance is something that we cover in like mastering server tuning and mastering, uh, uh, you know, with the resource database though, I think you're right on the resource database. So um, the resource database, well, I'm gonna put it in under system database. Um, system database and resource database recovery um, and why you shouldn't be going anywhere near that that's good um, so optimizing check DB uh, I ha it's hard for me to even believe that I have an hour-long module just on uh, optimizing check DB but yes I do uh, so let's go in terms of corruption prevention and recovery um, I also want in here uh, performance, tuning, oh yes, oh yes, Nick, oh that's very good, yes. Um, uh, performance tuning, uh, corruption checking, uh, offloading it, um, and then what was the other thing I was looking into in there? Uh, automatic page repair. Automatic page repair, uh, knowing if it's happening and failing out when it's happening. Uh, and then so Nick said backup encryption. Oh, yeah. Oh, golly, man. Um, so encryption uh, backups. Uh, TDE, always encrypted. Um, and I, am I going to teach them how to implement always encrypted? No, because that's something that developers go and do. But what I do want to do is I want to educate them at least on the pros and cons of each of these and uh, the overheads that they have and what kinds of data to look for inside your databases. I'm going to assume that she has no control over the development of the applications, but she does uh, at least be, she is partially responsible for when the company gets sued for things like compliance, um, which brings in another thing that I also want to say in there is auditing. Um, uh, and the depth to which I'm going to cover that, I'm not sure yet, but I, I definitely do need to cover that. Uh, da, 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 oh, ah, oh. Okay, so I used to spend time on SAN features, but this becomes an intriguing question in the day and age of the cloud. <laughs> Is she in the cloud? Like this will be an interesting thing to discuss in there. Uh, Sachin, uh, think in more detail. Tell me what you mean in more detail about that. Because uh, I think you're onto something. I don't know what it is though. I don't think you're on something. I just think you're onto something. Um, so the, the for is she in the cloud? So I, I don't know that I'm going to talk about SAN features anymore. I think I want to build something that's going to last for the next five, 10 years. I'm not saying SANs go away. SANs are magical. They're sweet. But I also don't want to spend a lot of time with something that's so dramatically different per vendor. To some extent, SAN snapshots aren't that different from VM snapshots. So as long as I'm covering the basics problems with snapshots inside the fundamentals class, I think I'm going to be okay.
Northern Canuck as opposed to a Southern Canuck. That's interesting. I've never thought about that. I guess maybe Snowbirds. Um, yeah, D D Anshu, yeah, DMV. Anything related to performance? That's our performance classes, Anshu. I'm, Anshu, I am this close to muting you. Uh, you're that close. Um, Northern Canuck says, is data masking worth covering? Yes, I, uh, she can't control the app. I'm going to say that she doesn't have anything to do with the T-SQL, but I think it is interesting because she will be asked by the developers, can you restore a version of production uh, down into development? So, uh, Sachin, yeah, so Sachin, you may want to come back to the original. Uh, you missed, I think you probably missed the first hour of the class. We talked about that in the first hour. So we'll say data masking, uh, particularly involving restoring production down to development. Uh, making sure devs don't see production data. And that that's going to be a lot of that class is just going to be like, here's why it's so hard. Here's why that's a function of development rather than uh, uh, rather than uh, production database administration. So I'm going to come back up and say what she knows. I'm also going to say what she doesn't control. App code, choice of cloud and server and storage vendor. Um, yeah, I know, that's probably good. I can just stop there. All right, so then what else we got inside here? I used to teach a module on server hardware sizing. Now these days that's much more performance, so I'm not as much interested in that. How to triage. You can see that this used to be like a two hour long course. David says, uh, da -da 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 -da. yeah, we covered most of that during um, MSDTC. Oh, God. Yeah, we covered a lot of that in the earlier one. I'm going to leave that. You can watch the earlier one. SPNs is a, oh, phew. SPNs. I'm going to write it down. I don't know if that's going to be in scope or not. Um, I'm going to say, you know what? I'm not going to, SPNs, uh, link to link to my favorite resources on that uh, only because I think it's something that uh, would take is for the attendees mouths off. Yes. Um, I think it's one of those uh, things that is so niche, like you don't need to know it often. And if you go through a training class on it, you're not going to remember it at the time when you need to use it. But you so you do need really deep um, knowledge on it when you need it, but I'd rather just link someone to uh, to a post on that. Will, that's a performance feature, so. All right, so that SPN, uh, DTC was another one. Uh, DTC, uh, SPN, a better case for SharePoint uh, databases. Uh, Anshu, you earned it, uh, you're getting a block. Uh, so now let's see here. So I'm happy with all those. Index maintenance was in was in uh, this one. Now I'm really worried about the length of time on the triage piece. Um, I might just make that a free. Oh, it is in the it's in the performance class too. That's in mastering server tuning. Uh, let me say um, how to triage is in mastering server tuning but I may make that a totally free course instead. So the, my logic behind that, um, so my logic behind that around uh, the free, around the how to triage a SQL server, there are so many good free resources out there, SP Blitz, Blitz Who, uh, Who is Active, and so many different audiences need to triage performance. So sometimes people, uh, so sometimes it's the developer's job, sometimes it's the dev DBA's job, sometimes it's the production DBA's job. I might just turn that into a 90 minute free class and then walk away from that just so that I can point everybody to that. Also, my material on that hasn't changed in like five, six, seven years. I do it for user groups. I've done it for all kinds of folks out there. You can find it in YouTube. So I'm going to remove that piece from the paid training classes and just make it free and uh, call that one a day. Nick says, recognizing the top queries. So like, why is my server on fire? That's actually in the triage course. So I have a 90 minute course that walks you through. Uh, first, you run SP was active. Look for lead blockers before you kill them. Here are the things that you go and look at. 
as pblitz cache to find the top 10 most resource intensive queries on the sucker board. If there's a query that jumps into the top 10 that you're not familiar with, odds are it's a parameter sniffing problem. Here's how you free that one plan from the cache, figure out whether performance got better or worse. SPBlitz index to go in, or SPBlitz first, I skipped one inside there, which will tell you things of like if a backup is running, if there's a long running query blocking others, etc. Um, so I walk through an entire process on that. It takes about 90 minutes altogether. Um, so I think I'm just going to leave that out as free. I'll make it more nice and I'll do it just kind of like I do how to think like the engine. Just put it right up at the top of my training page and go, when you're having a SQL Server emergency, go through this class. So you know what, that's probably what I'm going to do next weekend. Then next weekend, I'll probably go through and record that live just out on the stream so that y'all can see it and then use those recordings in for the, uh, the stuff that I use up on the site. Okay, good. Uh, so that nails down everything that was here. Now, I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on the stuff that I'd already thought of. Next, I want to hit the things that I haven't thought of. And you're like, well, Brent, what on earth is that? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a break and then I'm going to go query. This is going to sound odd, especially with Nick Craver here. For those of you who don't know, Nick is one of the folks over at Stack Overflow that uh, keeps you from losing your job because he makes sure that all your questions get answered on a timely basis. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go query the top most viewed SQL Server questions on sites like Stack Overflow and dba.stackexchange.com. I like looking at top viewed ones because it tells me these are problems that people have the most often. I may also find stuff in there that uh, may either be in the fundamentals class or may be in mastering. Who knows? We'll go through and see. So I'm going to take a five minute break here. I'm going to go refuel and I will see y'all back in here in five minutes. Adios.
right. <laughs> Jim says, I'll babysit your Targa while you're on vacation. You know, it's funny. We have to actually think about that, like where we're going to store the uh, Targa. The, and uh, uh, there's a really good set of facilities in L.A. because it's normal for people in L.A. to have their like collector cars or exotic cars up in storage and all air conditioned and guarded and all that. Uh, but I got to find one for Southern California, for San Diego. So I'm uh, kind of digging into it. Um, Northern Canuck says, uh, the, I don't have the, how about VMware settings for in VMware? I'm, I just added, well, because you made that question, I thought it was a really good question. I'm actually adding that to out of scope because I think something that's interesting from a training perspective, like for me teaching other people, is I only want to teach stuff that's going to have legs that when I build the class, it's going to be the same for the next three, four, five years. The, when you build training material, it takes a really long time to go build the material. Hell, y'all are seeing how long it takes just to lay out the landscape of what's, uh, what we're going to teach. Now, generally, for any hour of training, it takes me about 10 hours in order to build it because I got to go lay out. Next, I have to lay out what I want to teach in each module. I have to put together how I'm going to teach it. I'm going to show you just an interesting post on that the next time I go and build a course. Um, so it, it takes so much time to build it from the time that you sell it, it has to keep selling for a certain period of time or else you lose money on it. So as a side note, we had, um, uh, yeah, yeah, Northern Connect. Thanks. Glad you like it. Oh, Marcos. Oh, that's a great one. I'm going to write down that that's out of scope for this one. It is seriously in terms of market adoption. It's not really a thing. Um, but that, that's a, another great example of if you wanted to teach it, you would pour so much work into building it that your training material would be worthless within a year because it changes so fast. That's why you don't see good classes out on stuff like clustering or availability groups. It's just the changes roll through so quickly. And there's such monster topics. Like if you wanted to build a class on availability groups, Lord knows that Nick would uh, know that has a problem. Um, uh, <laughs> Surly Dev says, and uh, Nick, I'll hit your question too. Nick says, uh, uh, or Surly Dev says, I've been watching a guy updating his Pluralsight course on a stream, and some of the stuff he rewrote is already out of date. So true story, this, this actually happened to us. <laughs> So Jeremiah Peshka, one of my, <laughs> Richie, one of my business partners had a course that he wrote on Hadoop. So he wanted to write a course like a fundamentals of Hadoop kind of thing and put the class together, poured his heart into it, was you know very happy with the results. And within three months, it was out of date. And he realized that if he was going to keep the thing up to date, he would have to keep spending so much time working on the course that it would become kind of a full-time job. So, whew, yeah, it's tough. I, I see why people want to teach stuff at like Pluralsight, because you can ship the course once, make a bunch of money, and then Pluralsight doesn't necessarily make you keep it up to date. You can go into Pluralsight, see a lot of stuff that's already wildly stale, you know, just completely irrelevant. Mm. So Nick says, I'm curious what you think is on the line for performance versus server setup with remote storage reads, how that matters differently. So it's funny that you mentioned that. During the break, I was thinking if I pull um, the uh, triage stuff out of mastering server tuning, so I have a class mastering server tuning, triage is literally the last module. It's the last thing that I teach people. I'm like, what am I going to swap in its place? Because I got a list of things that I wanted to teach. And hardware, I've kind of said, is out of scope because I used to teach it and I would survey the attendees after that module because the module was so quiet. Nobody would ask any questions. So I surveyed the attendees. I'm like, when was the last time you did anything with like changing a server storage configuration? And it was like crickets. Nobody said anything. So I'm like, well, hell, okay, so if nobody's using that, then I don't want to teach it. But you know what? Now it's coming back because of the cloud. Because now with the cloud, people can change their storage configuration so much more easily that I actually want to start teaching that now again in mastering server tuning. That's exactly what I'm going to slide in in its place. I have a module on page I.O. latch weights. I have a module on page IO latch weights, and I have like five minutes at the end of it in mastering server tuning where I talk about, oh yeah, here's why you don't turn tune storage, why it's so hard. In the cloud these days, though, now I got to add that in. Uh, and it's interesting to think about how you scope classes, like where does cloud fit in and where does it not fit in? I thought about when I was going to do, I'm actually going to turn the AC down one notch inside here. Um, I thought about when I was building these classes, do I do a separate class called like fundamentals of Azure tuning, fundamentals of AWS tuning? 
and I just decided against it because it was so much work and it changes so fast because we're right back to the Hadoop thing. It's like we had the problems with um, uh, with Azure storage. <laughs> it's, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Good things. Well, EBS and in AWS, EBS and how the, the snapshot volumes work. And um, literally just last night, I was looking at Amazon FSx. Amazon FSx is their file sh uh, server as a service. They have it for Windows, so you can build clusters on top of it, failover clusters. Because I'm like, if I'm going to teach a course on mastering uh, database administration, I need them to be able to build a cluster. How much does it cost to use Amazon FSx? Holy hell, it was a lot of money. Uh, Nick says, wherever the cloud is in scope, don't install your DBs on the temp SSD as a note for newbie DBAs. I disagree. I disagree. And here's why. What I would say is that's true for Azure because Azure's VM cloud storage is a very amusing anecdote. I was going to say joke, but that's probably not fair to my friends who work at Microsoft. I don't know that I have any friends left who work for Microsoft. Um, so, but I in AWS, you do want to, but it's just that you want to also have high availability and disaster recovery. You want to be able to fail over. And if you lose your ephemeral SSDs, you got bigger problems with that VM anyway, and you want to fail out and evacuate from that. If, you, if the VM is in the kind of shape where it would lose its local ephemeral storage, then you got bigger problems. Uh, I'd be curious if you had another reason for that, though, too. Uh, but the Azure one, I know because of caching, because it uses it locally for caching. Oh, oh, 1D Lopez, that's a great question. That's such a good question. So uh, how long do I determine a length of a class? What I do is I have, oh, I should, I, oh, I would pull this open and show it to you, but it's going to, it would take a little while to go find. So what I actually do is I surveyed the, I did this years ago. I surveyed the entire market and I said, what are classes that are out there? Basically, who are my competitors before I start selling training? And what I said was, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Nick, I'll answer that one in a sec. So what I said was, uh, out there, there are a whole bunch of one-day classes. People are accustomed to paying about 100 bucks for a one-day SQL Saturday pre-con. At the time that I started teaching one-day classes, all SQL Saturday pre-cons were 95 bucks full stop. That was as high as they went. And I went, you know what, I'm going to teach one-day classes, and they're going to be the best one-day classes there are, and I'm going to charge more. It's going to be 200 bucks. And it worked. It was fine that I put a ton of effort into building the classes, like y'all see how much work goes into building the classes and scoping them and all that, picking the right target audience. So I build them out, 200 bucks, they sell fine, works great. Um, and now it's funny because you see other SQL Saturday presenters starting to ratchet up their prices. And I'm like, okay, just try ratcheting up your product too as well. And let's see how this goes. This goes. Um, but so I, at, the, at that point, there were a bunch of one day classes. And then on the higher side, there were five day classes. So in the four or five day classes, when you think you go to like New Horizons, Global Knowledge, you, you hear from Microsoft certified trainers who are just reading out of a book and they've never actually done it in real life. Those things, those four or five day classes were 2000 bucks. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to sell four or five day classes. And I, I was going to try and push it to like three, 4,000 bucks, but I'm like, well, let's see what happens. Um, and what I found was people's brains turned to fuzz after about three days. So you can sell them four or five day classes. They just don't pay attention. You know, like at three days, they're, they've gone as far deep as they can go and they need to get back to real life. Uh, so I'd go three days because I think that's about as max as I can go while still keeping someone deeply involved in it. Um, you, sure, college classes go longer. College classes go for weeks, but you don't learn eight hours a day on the same topic for weeks. Your brain gets the benefit luxury of context switching off to someone else, spending time with your family, letting the subject matter dig in, and then doing homework exercises that can last for hours or days. So the, the ones that I've settled on are one day and three days. So how I figure the length of a class is fundamentals, which are cheap, those go for 200 bucks. Those need to be beginner level classes. And then I break those up into one day. And then <laughs> it's, it's true. So with depending on the topic. And so that as uh, Wendy Lopez, I'll come back to that. Uh, so Nick's question was thinking of Azure when it goes kaboom and SLA doesn't guarantee the replication business or goodness. Oh, totally in AWS. It's the same exact thing. When you fail, when the VM goes kaboom and you fail over to another host, TempDB will be gone. But the beautiful part is that you can just have, because whenever it fails over, you're going to lose whatever was in TempDB anyway. The service is going to restart. Um, 
So what I'll do is in AWS, I just have a startup script that when Windows comes up, the first thing it does is go uh, put, uh, initialize the emperor, uh, ephemeral volumes because Amazon doesn't always guarantee that they'll be initialized. Um, and then create folders, you know, map it as a specific drive letter, like the Z drive, and then create folders under there, or mount points, however you want to do it for the ephemeral storage, so that when SQL Server starts up, the drive letter and file path are there. SQL Server won't create the root folder if you uh, want to put tempdb in like WAC, MS SQL WAC data. Uh, SQL Server won't create those if they're not already there on startup. So that's the one thing you got to watch out for. Uh, okay, so, hmm. so I said when we came back, I said I was going to go query the Stack Overflow database and look for highly voted questions. There's one thing that I want to do first. So in the mastering class, in the mastering class, four hours is way too long. Four hours is the problem with four hour sessions is just it's way too long. We, it's, I'm, I'm going to stop there. So if, if you want four hour long classes, that's a different problem. That's you can't get deep enough in a four hour class. I mean, you can, but it's just those are YouTubes. Go out to YouTube and go find those. Those those are basically free. Four hours or less is free. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, so now, so the thing I said that I wanted to go in here was, um, by the time that she gets to this, she's already got the first responder kit up and running installed by the time Anita gets to the mastering class. One thing that I didn't do, big hugger? Yeah, I was going to say before our cl class will take you a day off work. That's, that's tricky. Um, over on the left hand side, what I didn't do in fundamentals was I didn't have her set up a job that writes SP Blitz first to table every 15 minutes. Now, I'm not going to teach her in this class what the output is good for, but for the benefit of her future career, I want to teach her how to log diagnostic data to tables every 15 minutes so that later as she's doing performance troubleshooting, she can come back to those tables and leverage that. So one thing I'm going to add on that I'm going to teach her, whoops, uh, da, 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 da. One thing that I'm going to log on or to put in that I'm going to teach her is how why to log SP Blitz first to table every 15 minutes. I'm not going to teach how to analyze and interpret that data in this class, but I'll give her pointers to the classes where she can learn it. I just want to put this in place so she has the data when she needs it. All right, cool. So now we got those. We got fundamentals and mastering. I'm going to leave those files open because I go and query uh, Stack Overflow. I'm probably going to find stuff that I want to go add in. So how do you query Stack Overflow? You go to data.stackexchange.com. Data.stackexchange.com is like a web-based uh, user interface for a SQL Server Management Studio that goes to a recently restored copy of Stack Overflow. This is an official site run by Stack Overflow themselves. So for those of you who don't have your own copy of the Stack Overflow data, database, it makes it really easy for you to go run queries against it. So I'm going to start by running one at Stack Overflow. So I'm going to go into Stack Overflow. I'm going to go compose a query. <laughs> yeah, and every Sunday if the restore doesn't go boom. And of course, watch me querying during a Sunday. Uh, so enter a title. So I'm going to find most or top viewed uh, questions for one tag. Now, over on the right hand side, you've got uh, the whole full list of all the tables and columns inside the Stack Overflow schema. I know it decently well enough that I'm probably going to be able to pull this off for the most part without reading through here. So I'm going to write the query. I'm not going to explain how I'm writing. I'm just going to go. So I'm going to say select top 100 from DBO post P, where P post type ID equals one. That's questions. Uh, order by P view count descending. I need a tag. I need a filter for one specific tag. And if I remember right, there is, it's just called post tags. It's probably not in there. So we'll say enter join DBO post tags PT on P uh, ID equals PT post ID. And uh, PT, really wish that we had IntelliSense on here, right? Because I can't remember what, it's tag ID, perfect. 
So then inner join DBO tags T on PT tag ID equals T ID. So T tag, and it's probably going to be tag name. Let's see. Tag synonyms, tag name. Yep. Tag name equals. Now, I, I really need a parameter in for this, and I never remember it. So this data.stackexchange.com has all kinds of cool things that you can use for uh, add-on type stuff that's ever so slightly different than SQL Server uh, Management Studio. So here I can say parameter value, beautiful. Uh, so I can type a default type value, copy, uh, and then paste. So parameters name is going to be tag name type is a string and then the value is going to be SQL server. Let's see if that works. Uh, now I need, so what am I going to do? Select top 100 P star. Uh, that should work. Let's see. And let's see what happens. Run the query. Let's see how badly we got it. Let's see if she works. Ta-da! Now, there are some, <laughs> so this gives me the list of questions and it gives me a bunch of other stuff, but there are some cool things that you can do inside uh, uh, data.stackexchange.com that will do things like hyperlink an ID. To do it, I'm going to go back over to the help. And I'm going to say, see here, it says magic columns and auto linking. So here I'll name it as post link. So P I D we'll, we'll go with view count and then P I D as post link. Then I also want the title P title uh, and that should give me enough. Let's go see what we get out of there. If all I'm trying to do is see the top 100 uh, tags, beautiful. So now I get, oh, it automatically names the uh, post link with the title. Oh, look at that. People at Stack Overflow are so smart, so I don't even need that. That's just magical. So I'm doing top 100 because queries with top 100 get a lower memory grant and they generally run faster. Am I probably going to need more than 100 columns? Yes, but this would at least get me to make sure that my syntax worked the way I want it to. So now I have ordered by... Uh, <laughs> oh no, Nick, it's no, that's, oh, that's disappointing. Uh, and I, I don't think I have access to, no, I don't have that anymore. I used to have um, the uh, uh, MVC mini profiler access up there too. I don't know why. Or you know what? You probably had it universally for everybody. That's what I bet what it was. Um, so now what I can do is I can start to go through here. I'm going to scan and just see, are there database administration type stuff that I would want to include inside a database administration course? This, these questions are from Stack Overflow. I'm only going to look at the top 100. Then I'm going to shift gears and look at a different site, which is dba.stackexchange.com. That's where database administrators post their questions. The other thing you can think of this as is it's a really good way to find blog post concepts to go and write. So before I give you all the URL, I'm going to change it over to top 1000 and we'll say run query. And then we'll get the, did you go, you're still running. See now it's, it, sh it should take longer usually for a 1000 query to run. Get our permalink in here. So now I can copy that permalink and go dump it into chat so that y'all can go see and run exactly the same question. So the query I'm using, boom. So we'll see if that works. Maybe it won't work. That's all right. I'm putting it into the chat. It's not actually showing on Restream. That's okay. Um, oh, well, here, we'll do it this way. Uh, Twitch, and then dump it in oh, onto here, there. We'll do it this way. Uh, no! Twitch, mute! Mute! We'll just close that. All right, so now we have this. So how do I do an update from a select? Nope, 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 nope. Uh, oh, good. There it finally went. Yeah, and as I went down, uh, nope, 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 nope. These are all great uh, data or uh, developer questions. Mm, nope, nope. 
Yes. How do you clear the transaction log? Yes. That is going in fundamentals. Yes. Uh, what's the size of the transaction log? What should your size of the transaction log be? I thought I heart Richie was like I heart Richie. And then I'm like, did Richie change something about his username trying to trying to be uh, different there? Um, so I'm going to say under how to configure, I had a how to, uh, there we go, um, log file sizing. So there we go. Uh, I'm not just log file sizing, but log file sizing, what clears the log file, why it's so big. All right, there we go. Uh, what else we got inside here? So that was a good one there. Let's see. Um, how do I remove dupe? Nope, nope, we're not doing any of these. Um, what tempdb is used for um and Hanny says why shrinking data files is bad as a subject i don't know that i'm going to go into depth on that i don't think i'm going to go into depth on that i don't think it's uh i'm not going to go into depth on that i'm making a judgment call there because of course if i'm going to if i'm going to do some teaching i may link people to free resources but i'm not going to spend if somebody spends 200 bucks on a training class with me and if i feel like i teach them why shrinking is bad i feel like i stole their money uh, da, 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 da. Um, how do I see active connections? Yeah, I think what TempDB is for, and I, I went right past it, so what uses it? Um, yeah, we'll stop there. What uses it is a really good one. Uh, dangers of it growing uh, since the public has access to it. There we go. Uh, insert a line break. Da, 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 da. Oh, what time zone should my server be in? I'm not going to put that. That's out of scope, but I want to give them links to go learn it. What time zone should my server be in? What are the implications of changing the time zone after SQL Server uh, is has been used? Uh, good morning. Good morning. So like versus da 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 da, da. That's <laughs> it is. I, I agree. And I'm going to totally say that. I'm going to be like, look, is when you're installing a new one from scratch, it should be UTC. But that's all I'm going to go into there. Whoops. Oh, I didn't want to go into that uh, particular one. All right. So we went pretty far down in Stack Overflow. Now let's switch sites. So the, one of the cool things about Stack Overflow is it's basically the same database schema across all kinds of different websites. So I could go run this exact same thing on, for example, Skeptics. Skeptics is a really cool uh, site. I'm going to say Skeptics just so that y'all can see it because it's freaking amazing. Now, the tag name SQL Server isn't a good one. I'm going to go to Skeptics uh, Stack Exchange. Uh, and then, so just so that I can see what the tags look like, uh, popular, let's see, quotes, that's actually interesting, sexuality, all right, I'm curious, let's go see. So let's see the top questions on sexuality from the skeptic's point of view, because this is specific, all right, so, wow, ooh. All right, so uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to bookmark that. So add pin, and I'm going to put that in under interesting because there are going to be a whole lot of things inside here that I'm totally covering for the weekly links because there are going to be some amazing stuff. Uh, but now let's switch over to, let's kind of change out of the tag name because we don't need that anymore. Uh, tag name SQL Server, and then let's switch over to database administrators. And what are there any questions tagged sexuality under database administrators? I probably don't want to know the answer to them. Uh, so then we'll go run the query and go see what's going on. Um, uh, Nick says, suggest possibly filtering the creation date for one to two years. You know, the other thing that I should do is I should uh, divide it out for views per month or like per year so that that way you could see if there's something brand new that was created that's rocketing up the charts. That's another thing that would be really interesting. Um, oh, wow. Oh, these are so beautiful. Oh, these are good. This is why I do this query. Okay, so now we're going to start having some stuff that's relevant to the clouds. 
Now, Nick says we don't have view counts over time. No, but what I was going to say is just evenly divide uh, views by the number of months that since the creation date. So we could get views per month, and then that way things would start to normalize out. Hell, let's just go do it. So let's say we're going to get date, and we're going to have divide by zero problems in here. I can see this coming already. Um, order by... Whew, so I'm going to have to get the date diff. So I'm going to have to get, so let's figure it out. So I'm going to have to divide view count by the number of, let's just go days. Uh, view count times 1.0 divided by date diff dd um, p creation date uh, get date. Uh, we could say last activity date, but I kind of like that. Let's see what happens with that. Um, day, oh, oh, no, no, nice, nice. Yeah, I like that. Uh, date add plus one day. Woo! I can't go your mind. Just subscribed. Thank you. I appreciate that. I wish I was smart enough to read what I always love Russian letters and like the whole that, that whole lettering style. There's a sailboat in San Diego that has a, a, a Russian name on it or a Ukrainian name. I'm not quite sure. Uh, so let's uh, let's just start running that. Oh, we'll say and here's what we'll do. And p creation date uh, date is before date add uh, dd minus fourteen get date. Uh, let's see what happens there. So run. Please don't divide by zero. Please don't divide by zero. Yeah. Um, so now you notice that now they're not sorted by view count. So let's call this, let's throw this in here too as well. Copy, uh, boom, as views per day. Let's try that. And perfect. Oh, nice. And just to make it really nice, we'll put that in in the beginning. Uh, do, 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 do. And then cut that. And then boom. Uh, as total views and run. I got an extra comma there and run. And there we go. Um, yet uh, uh, Mike says, aren't older posts potentially very popular? Yes, absolutely. But I don't just because something's old and crappy doesn't mean I want it to skew high in the results. So like you can see here, the total views all are all over the place. It's just that some of them rocketed up the top uh, earlier because they're uh, having, that's just great. Like that one happens to me every now and then. Okay, so this is just beautiful. This is a golden list of good stuff. Uh, let's see here. So I'm going to permalink back to that one. Okay, good. So now we're back to this. Now let's come out of here. I'm going to move this around a little bit just so that I can have my notes. So here's the page and then my notes for both fundamentals. I'm going to move fundamentals up on the top left and I'm going to move mastering down below just so that we can jump around uh, depending on where we find something interesting at. Uh, welcome to the club, Tinker and Think. That's a really good name, Tinker and Think. I like that. That's actually quite good. Um, so for an intro course, SSMS versus ADO, I, I'm not going anywhere. I don't think you can charge for it. And I think it's going to change so fast with, uh, with, uh, Microsoft's rapid changes in Azure, Azure data, uh, what the hell's the thing called studio, Azure data studio. I, I'm a, a huge believer in Azure Data Studio. I love it, and I'm willing to invest building the course in an Azure Data Studio notebook. For fundamentals, I think it's the right place to go and grab the brand new database administrator and ease them into that. I think it'll pay off for them long term. I don't, I don't want to try and teach them the differences, though. Okay, so sadly, you're absolutely right. There we go. So let's see here. So in here, I can't connect to my server's database via an IP address. So connection problems, I'm going to say is possibly in scope. So possibly in scope or maybe a new uh, class. So just noting because they added SSMS. Yeah, I, I have a hard time. The, the notebooks, they didn't really add notebooks, did they? They just added go create this as a notebook in SSMS. Like S, you can't create a new notebook from scratch in SSMS, can you? I don't think you still can. Um, so troubleshooting a connection problem. 
Uh, Oizoken. Oh, wow. I, thought, I would have thought you would have already been. Oizoken, just ladies and gentlemen, is one of the smartest people in this room. I mean, at least they give me really good answers when I ask questions. Um, Hanny, I, I would want to say, what, what's the problem that we're going to solve with SB Configure? I don't know that teaching someone SP Configure is really massively valuable when they have GUI options to, to do it. Um, so let's see here. So we got we got that uh, can't connect. That was interesting. Stuck in restoring state. So the reason I got so excited, this this up here was the one, the very top line is the one that I got super excited about because I'm like, rollbacks and redo. This is something that I think uh, mastering database administration, you need to have some basic concepts of what rollbacks involved, what roll forwards involved, um, how restarts impact this, how failovers impact it, how 2019's new accelerated database recovery impacts it, all that good stuff. It's definitely a master thing, but let's come down here and say, uh, redo and undo, uh, how restarts, failovers are impacted, uh, restores, same thing as well, restores, uh, timing of backups, especially groups of databases, marked transactions, um, ac uh, accelerated database recovery, I think it's called. Uh, database recovery. Um, Jatendra, we talked about that in the first hour. You're only two hours late, so it's not so bad. Um, what restore? Ooh, restoring transaction logs with no restore. I'm going to throw that back up in the advanced piece because that was so um, attaching, hack attaching a database. Um, may need to do after the undo redo section. Uh, so that's good. Uh, it's a Twitch voice says do people unfollow and unfollow just to get their name up to pop up. Everybody wants to be famous. Um, the next one was uh, move. Oh, so uh, stuck in restoring state. So that was interesting in here. Uh, when databases are stuck in startup or restoring. So let's link over to that because that's really cool. Copy, paste, and get rid of you. Um, then the how do I move SQL Server database files? Um, you know what's really funny? This comes up. I don't know that I'm going to blog. I don't know that it's going to be in the training class, but this comes up a lot. How to move a database with log shipping on the same instance. I am a huge fan of not doing detach retach. I would rather just be, uh, oh, no, 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 database states in general. That, Nick, that's actually a good one. Um, startup is the other way that I would say it. Uh, phases of startup. Uh, that's really, I'm going to kind of say it's in part of undo and redo. Um, a hecaton, too, is another thing that's going to affect that. Um, yeah, phases of startup, crash recovery. All right, that's good. Uh, so let's see, we got that. Cases of. Da, da, da. Um, note that AG start there. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, availability groups. Uh, oh, here, I'm going to put it under phases of startup. Um, order of databases, um, availability groups, failing over triggers, startup of databases, how this affects the plan cache. Uh, because, uh, yep, that's that's totally good. Uh, da -da -da. How to tell if database server is healthy. We're going to do uh, f uh, performance isn't going to be something that we cover inside here. Um, Hanny says corruption fixing. We talked about that uh, earlier also. Hello, Netherlands. Um, Mace 2 says greeting from greetings from Finland. Howdy. Uh, all right, so that's cool. Oh, uh global temp tables. Um, temp, in tempdb, I, I, I hit in fundamentals, I talk about tempdb. I don't think I'm going to talk about global. I'm not going to talk about global objects because we're going to assume that she doesn't have control over the code. Uh, okay, so I think, ooh, no. Uh, oh, domain, cross domain stuff. Uh, that's out of scope. I'm just going to be, oh. Uh, cross domain authentication. I'm going to get rid of that right here, right now. Um, oh, why SQL Server is config consuming memory? I am putting that up in fundamentals. Um, 
uh, why SQL Server uses so much memory. Uh, only because I think it's uh, the kind of thing that a, a starting sysadmin, a fundamentals uh, student wants to know. I get it even from senior people, but um, how to handle time zones, CCIs. Um, I only, you know, I consider that, and that's in uh, mastering, in, excuse me, mastering index tuning. Uh, but I, I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, da -da 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 -da, query last restore date. That's yeah, okay. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I actually like that quite a bit. Um, under security, signing, search, signing, uh, security. So signing stored procedures with certificates to let your junior folks or help desk people run them. Uh, da, 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 that's not really, no, no, <laughs> um, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, oh yeah, how to roll back after the wrong update statement. All right, let's just go and look. Let's go see how bad this is. Um, uh, da -da -da. question already has answer back here. Uh, so let's see, the question already has answer here. So what's this one? I mistakenly deleted. How do I get them back? Oh my God, I wrote that. I wrote that. I wrote that answer. I know, because I recognize this. That's almost a decade ago. We're coming up on 10 years ago that I wrote that thing. Wow, I, that was really good. And I had 118 reputation points for that. That's kind of phenomenal. Um, so let's see here. Uh, a couple of people uh, talking T-SQL questions. We're not going to do that. Uh, Mike, that's a great question, but we're not gonna, I'm not going to cover anything like development related inside the course. Um, oh, connection pooling works. Um, I talk about thread pooling and blocking in mastering server tuning. You know what I don't talk about is connection pooling. And I'm going to talk about, I want to add that to mastering server tuning. Uh, connection pooling, detecting health of connection pooling problems, implicit transactions. Uh, do that in mastering server tuning. Yeah, Mike, I know where you're going, but I'm not going to do any deployment stuff. Like all development deployment type stuff will be in other classes. This is only production database administration. Um, um, RPO and RTO, we actually cover in the fundamentals one. So we do talk about that one up in the fundamentals one. Uh, all right, so these are pretty good. Uh, ta -da 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 -da. memory usage by SQL Server again. All right, I'm cool. Uh, 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 you should not be remote desktoping in. Um, where to install management tools, why you shouldn't RDP into SQL Server. I'm going to do that as a fundamentals one up over there, how to disable RDP. I am a huge fan of monitoring the remote sessions uh, perfmon counter and alerting the whole team whenever that's anything other than zero. Oh, SSL, actually. That needs to be over in mastering in the security piece. Um, so configuring SSL or protecting connections with SSL, protecting connections with SSL. And I'm not even going to spend 10 minutes on it in the class, but I just want to link to Aaron Bertrand has a great post on how you go about doing that and what's required. So I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, exactly. SSL and TLS. All of that, I'll just link over to Aaron's post on it because it is really good. All right. <laughs> So we've spent a lot of time fleshing out. We gathered things that we thought about personally. We also went out to Stack Overflow and gathered some things. I'm happy now that I've got a wide list of things. Frankly, I have more stuff than I can teach in both classes. The next thing that I'm going to have to go, to, uh, go work on is how do I put these into a sensible order for storytelling? How do I go about telling those stories? I get a feeling that I'm going to end up having to pull a lot of stuff out of both courses simply because I can't teach it all. What I end up doing at the end of each module is I say, people who liked this also liked. You know, I try to say, if you found this topic interesting, here are your next paths for learning. Um, one other side note that I just find kind of interesting is, as I'm building each of these modules out, I have to decide how I'm going to teach it. 
With performance tuning, I love teaching via demos. I love showing people something and going here. When I push SQL Server here, this happens over on the other side. With production database administration, it tends to be different because a lot of times you need to teach really big concepts that would take a really long time to put together into a SQL Server. So uh, I end up using a lot of PowerPoints to teach database administration type topics. Uh, so I'll leave you with one thing that I find kind of interesting myself. So ProBlogger has this post. So ProBlogger types of blog posts. And this sounds kind of cheesy. It's almost like it sounds like it's going to be a BuzzFeed type thing. But this is actually really awesome. So 52 types of blog posts that are proven to work. What this is really good for is it teaches you how to break out of your shell in the ways that you would normally tell a story. Most of the training presentations I see are here is a feature, here are the configuration switches for this feature, here is when you use each of these configuration switches, and it's boring as hell. You know, it's just like one bullet point after another, there's no storytelling. This really helps me break out of that storytelling thing, because the ones that are one, two, three, these are the ones that you and I think of when we're going to go write a presentation. But there are so many interesting ways of doing this, case studies, problems and solutions. One of my favorite uh, problems and solutions technique is to invent a character, for example, like we did with uh, uh, Anita, whatever her last name was, and B BO problem. Um, we invent a personality and a character and we tell the story of that character. We say, all right, this is Sam, the senior, senior DBA, and she's having a problem with log shipping. When she tries to set it up, she has this error. So let's go look at Sam's server and see why she's having this problem, then we'll show Sam how to fix it. So it gets the, the watcher, the attendee to fall in love with a person and like want them to succeed in their story and vanquish the villain and all that. Um, things that I never would have thought of writing until I started reading some of this stuff. Comparison posts, like if you want to teach somebody the differences between or if you want to teach someone both failover clustering and always on availability groups. Yeah, that's 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 true. Uh, failover clustering and always on availability groups, you do a pro and con of each and you just compare the whole thing so that the audience understands which one to do. Uh, controversial posts like my SQL Server standard edition sucks and it's all your fault type post. Um, it's a great list of things that you can go through and figure out in interviewing somebody else. So I find this really interesting and I use it for a presentation design uh, too as well. So a quick, a quick shout out to this week's sponsor. So this week's webcasts are all brought to you by Quest Software. Quest is bringing me and Pinal in to do an Ask the Expert session. And I love using those terms kind of loosely, um, where we're going to do a totally open Q&A on performance, production database administration tasks. You can go register for that over at brentozar.com slash go slash experts. Totally free webcast on June 24th. If you can't be there live, Registering for it is the only way that you're going to get access to the recordings. This won't be up on YouTube, won't be streamed publicly. So you have to be in on the guest list in order to get access to the recordings. So you can sign up for that over at brentozar.com slash go slash expert. Now that is everything that I wanted to get done this morning. It's coming up on 7 a.m. here local time out in uh, San Diego. I am going to go out and go grab myself a fresh breakfast sandwich and a fresh, uh, fresh cup of coffee instead of making my own at home. And then I usually try and do all my blogging and uh, like presentation design work kind of stuff in before my wife wakes up. My wife is usually up around 9 a.m. Uh, on the weekends, so that's why I usually you'll usually see me doing all my free streaming type stuff uh, in before then. So thanks for hanging out with me. <laughs> it's the Twitch Voices. Are you going to be live every day this week? No, I actually teach training class. So um, tomorrow I have a client. I have two different clients actually inside the uh, same time span tomorrow. And, well, two different time spans. And then uh, I teach classes Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I think I have another client. So you probably won't see me in all week until uh, Saturday. So thanks, everyone. I'm glad you've uh, had fun watching it. And I will see you all in the next stream. Adios. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.